Good morning, Saints. Welcome to worship here at St. Andrew Presbyterian Church Online. It's May the 17th, and we are glad that you are here worshiping together with us. We hope that we will be back uh, in this space all together worshiping real soon, uh, but we don't know exactly when that'll be just yet. Keep an eye out for updates coming in your email. Um, as we worship together today, I invite you to download the order of worship. If you haven't done that yet, you can get that from our website or you can get that from the link in the YouTube video right here and uh, print that out so you can follow along and participate in worship. It is, um, we're still in the middle of going the social distance. It's not too late. If you have signed up and you haven't run yet, you can do that. Uh, if you would still like to make a donation, our team has hit our fundraising goal, but that's no reason that you should stop uh, stop supporting that worthy cause. So uh, if you want to do that, you can get on our website and there's a link to do that um, from there. Um, now let's take a moment and prepare our hearts for worship. Now join me in our call to worship. Bless our God, all you people. Let God's praise ring out in this place. God has kept our coming and going. God has not let our feet slip. Even though you have tested us and tried us as silver is tried and led us through fire and water, you have been with us. You led us out into a spacious place. Come and listen all who fear God, and we will tell you what God has done. God hears our prayers. God's steadfast love remains forever. Let us praise the Lord.
us pray. God, we are here to worship you today. We are gathered in many different places. We are gathered in a different way from what we're used to. But we are here together singing, glorifying, praising your name. We are so grateful to be connected in you, through you. As you've called us into this place and this time, wherever we are, you have planned for us to be here. It is by your will and by your guidance that we answer you, that we lift our voices before you, that we turn our hearts to you. We ask that you would bless and sanctify our worship this day, enable us to truly experience your presence, to know you, and to follow you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, friends, we know that as we come before God, we have not always been consistent. We have not always lived up to those those ideals that we hold for ourselves. We know God has required of us to, to live a certain way, and we know that we have not always done that. So let's join together in our prayer of confession. Lord Jesus, you promised that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And in the same breath, you promised an advocate would come to us. You, Lord, were faithful to your promise, but we have broken your law of love. We have hoarded resources rather than feeding your sheep. We have stoked competition rather than kneeling at others' feet. We have kept silent rather than testifying to our belief. For not showing our love for you by loving one another, forgive us. Help us obey your commandments and keep us ever faithful to your word by the power of your spirit who abides with us and among us. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, the old is gone, the new has come. In Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. And in Jesus Christ, nothing separates you from the love of God. This is the good news for God's people today. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you. And And also with you. Now let's share the peace of Christ with one another. As we do so, we know that uh, it's, it's... Hard to do with all the people that you normally would want to, but take as long as you need and uh, get in contact with anybody who needs to hear about God's peace today. Now let's affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
turn now to scripture. And our first reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 22. I invite you to listen for God's word. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ the Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to John, from the 14th chapter, beginning with the 15th verse, verses 15 through 21. Listen for the word of the Lord. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the principal tenets of our Christian faith is that Jesus loves us. It's etched into our brains at a very young age. The first song I remember learning, and probably one of the first songs that you learned, was Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones for him belong. They are weak, but we are strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. And indeed, the Bible informs us that Jesus does love us. God loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. We will see that love explicitly demonstrated in our scripture lessons this morning. And if your parents took you to Sunday school and church, you were surely influenced by other songs and hymns of Christ's love. The pastor I was most influenced by as a young adult prefaced his morning prayer with the first verse of 
What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Not once does the word love appear in any of the three verses of that hymn. But you might want to ask yourself, why is, why is it that God incarnate in Jesus Christ listens to our prayers and bears our sins and griefs? The answer is very simple. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. There's perhaps no place in the Bible where we are more capable of feeling Christ's love with any greater intensity than in the Gospel of John, and especially within the context of our Gospel lesson this morning, where Jesus is preparing his disciples for his eventual departure. Jesus has good reason for being concerned. The disciples have been with Jesus for three years, listening to his teaching, watching him heal the blind, cure the lame, and cast out demons. They were recently present when he raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. The disciples ate with Jesus, traveled with Jesus, and now have followed him for the third time to Jerusalem. Jesus had become more than just a teacher to them. He had become their friend, their confidant, their source of hope and dreams for the future. What are they going to think when he tells them he's bailing on them? Jesus doesn't want his disciples to be discouraged or distraught or afraid because of his absence. Instead, he wants to instill hope and purpose and confidence into their lives to the point where they can carry on Jesus' ministry after he leaves. John devotes five chapters to this preparation in what we refer to as Jesus' final discourse. This final discourse begins in a room in which he has gathered his, four, his 12 disciples for a meal, followed by a rather lengthy dissertation. The day is Thursday of that first Holy Week. In just a matter of hours, he will be arrested, tried, and nailed to a cross. As a sign of his love for his disciples, he withdraws from the supper table, ties a towel around his waist, and begins washing the disciples' feet. One of his disciples, Peter, is reluctant to have his feet washed. He feels it's below the dignity of a teacher to stoop to the level of a servant in order to perform this menial task of hospitality. Peter misses the point. Becoming a servant is exactly what Jesus wants to portray. Jesus is the teacher, and he is teaching the disciples what it means and how it feels to be loved. And then he explains to his disciples that what they had just witnessed was an example. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. From Jesus' perspective, it's not enough that the disciples receive Jesus' love. They need to love others as well. In fact, he articulates this concept to his disciples in the form of a new commandment. I give you a new commandment, he told his disciples, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. It's important to remember that in John's gospel, Jesus' commandment, or sometimes John expresses this in the plural as commandments, are all about loving others, which brings us to our gospel reading this morning. Jesus brackets our scripture lesson this morning with two statements emphasizing obedience. In the first one, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And at the conclusion of our scripture lesson this, uh, this morning, he essentially says, says the same thing. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. Sandwiched in between these two statements is a promise from Jesus to his disciples that if they love him and keep his commandments, he will pray to the Father and the Father will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The fact that Jesus will always be with us is an important affirmation maybe one of the most important affirmations that we as Christians can believe. Jesus promises his disciples that he would not leave them orphaned. The word orphaned is a word that implies total abandonment by parents and guardians, whether by death or any other reason. It's a word that signifies that we are alone and on our own without benefit of another person's wisdom and resources. But Jesus promises that that would never, ever happen to those 
who trust and obey him. Some of you may recall that in the 1992 Summer Olympics held in Barcelona, Spain, a young British runner by the name of Derek Redman competed in the 400-meter race. He had trained his entire life for this race and had distinguished himself by breaking his country's record at age 19. He led throughout most of the race and past the halfway mark, he was virtually a shoe-in to win the race. But with 175 meters to go, he hears a pop and feels the pain of an injured right hamstring muscle. Anyone, including myself, who has ever experienced the pain of a hamstring injury knows the excruciating pain this type of injury causes. He tries to hop on one foot but falls to the ground. Medical personnel come to pick him up on a stretcher, but he won't have anything to do with them. He didn't train his entire life or come this far not to complete the race. Meanwhile, his father, Jim, is up in the top of the stands. Seeing his son in trouble, he begins racing down from the top row. He pushes towards the track, sidestepping some people and bumping into others. He has no right or credential or permission to be on the track, but all he can think about is getting to his son to help him up. He is absolutely single-minded about this and isn't going to be stopped by anyone. Finally, he reaches his son, grabs hold of him and says, I'm here, son. We'll finish this race together. And with 65,000 fans cheering him on, they hobble towards the finish line. A few yards before the finish line, his father releases his son so he can cross the finish line by himself and complete the race. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit stands in for us and helps us complete the race. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave us abandoned or orphaned, but sticks with us throughout this lifetime and into the next. Jesus told his disciples that he will not leave them orphaned. I am coming to you, he says, and his coming is in the form of the Holy Spirit, or here called in the Greek, the paraclete, or the advocate. Some translations refer to the Holy Spirit as comforter, helper, counselor, and indeed the Holy Spirit is all of these things. Jesus told his disciples that even after his death, he would still be with them. He will still encourage them, plead with them, pray for them, teach them, and comfort them. But the nature of his presence will change. In a little while, he told his disciples, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. He will be present to them in the form of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. The disciples will not have to run their race alone, and they will not have to cross the finish line alone, and neither will we. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of life. Because I live, promises Jesus to his followers, you will live also. The good news is that Jesus has conquered the power of sin and death, and the same God who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to our bodies through his spirit that dwells in us. No matter what tragedies come our way, whether they are academic or medical or vocational or emotional or virus-related, we can hold tight to the promise that Jesus gives us the gift of life abundant life in the world today and life eternal in the world to come. Of course, there are strings, strings attached. Jesus talks about obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's important to note that Jesus isn't saying, if you want my love, you have to keep my commandments. What he is saying is that by keeping Jesus' commandments, you show your love and faith in Jesus. You can't earn Jesus' love, but you can surely demonstrate it. Just as important, if you love Jesus, you're going to want to obey Jesus. And in John's Gospel, keeping Jesus' commandments isn't that hard to remember. The important thing to keep in mind is that the commandments of Jesus all involve living a life of love. Remember, just a few verses earlier, Jesus told his disciples, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. 
In our first lesson this morning, the disciple Peter, writing to the churches in Asia Minor who are suffering because of their newfound faith, he explains this. Even in times of suffering, it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. In Jesus Christ, God has given us the perfect example of perfect love for others. So why did Jesus suffer and die for us? Why did Jesus not leave his disciples orphaned, but came to them in the form of the Holy Spirit? The answer is very simple. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Thanks be to God. Amen. We are blessed once again this morning by having another one of our choir members sing for us, sing a very familiar song, and I think you'll understand that it expresses Christ's love for us. Debbie? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, 
gracious Redeemer, comforting Spirit, we want so much not to be alone in this life. We want to trust that you are always watching over us, and that you are always stepping in for us, praying for us, advocating for us, empowering us, and comforting us. Help us to trust and obey. Help us to trust that you are always near to us, hearing our prayers, attending to our needs, encouraging us when we are challenged. Even in our suffering, Lord, help us to do good and keep us strong in our faith, knowing that you never abandon us or forsake us. Help us to believe that we belong body and soul in life and in death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And then help us to keep Jesus' commandments by loving others as Jesus loved us. Lord, today we pray for those in our church and our community who are troubled, who need to know that they are not alone. We hold before you those who are experiencing the grief of losing that which is important to them, that which has helped shape their lives, be it a job, a home, a way of life, or a loved one. Grant that they may encounter the risen Christ and receive renewed hope for the future. Heavenly Father, your Son gives rest to those weary with heavy burdens. Heal the sick in body, mind, and spirit. We pray for doctors and nurses, EMTs, and all other medical personnel who are working to save lives in our medical institutions during these uncertain times of a virus pandemic. We pray for those in authority and government and for our military. Now we take this time of intercessory prayer so that those of you at home can lift up to God the names of those you know need God's healing touch. Make the weak strong, we pray, the sick healthy, and the broken whole. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
friends, indeed, Jesus does love you. For the Bible tells us so. Jesus loved you so much that he went to the cross for you, for your sins and for your salvation, and so that you would be brought to God. And Jesus didn't just leave us abandoned. When he, when he went to be with the Lord, he left us the Holy Spirit to comfort us, to advocate for us, to pray for us. And he will help us run that race. He will run it right next to us. And he will lead us into eternal life. And the peace of God that surpasses all our understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you always. And all of God's people said, Alleluia. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.